name is Anthea Hartig, and I have the honor of being the executive director here to welcome you to our Mexican Mother's Day celebration. Uh, many of you know that Mexican Mother's Day has been celebrated every day on May 10th since 1922. You might not know the 1922 part, but it's become just a beautiful day in Mexico and throughout um, the, the world that we live in, which of course is Mexican uh, long before it was American. Um, today we have a very special treat for you, and before I introduce our very esteemed and very uh, beautiful guest, I want to thank all of my staff and my volunteers and all of you for being here. Um, you've been uh, having a beautiful afternoon starting at noon, yes. and so please um, pick on flowers for your mommies and make bracelets and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy and learn. Uh, all about Juan Briones, Sousa, California, which is the exhibition that uh, envelops you right now. So.
jadi jadi jago pin 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 itu 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 asih mailah wanita wanita kuando baila baila wanita kuando baila baila con el codo con el codo 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 mano 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 la cadera 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 con la rodilla 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 Así baila Juanito, Juanito cuando baila, 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 baila Juanito cuando baila, baila con el hombro, con el hombro, 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 con el codo, 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 con la mano, 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 con la cadera, 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 cabeza, con la cabeza, esa, esa, con el hombro, 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 con el codo, 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 con la mano, mano, mano. Dera, 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 con la rodilla, 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 con el pie, 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 con el dedito, dito, dito, así baila Juanito. La purga de San José. En la purga de San José, yo compré una guitarra. Vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. En la pulga de San José, yo compré un violín.
Daniel Sanchez with the uh, Juan Bautista de Anza Historic Trail, the National Park Service. And um, we're here today to talk about uh, Juana Briones. Juana Briones' mother came on the Anza Expedition in 1776, uh, which was the expedition for the first uh, non native families to establish a settlement here in San Francisco, California. Yeah, a coloring book here. Uh, many worlds, native life along the Anza Trail. Got the map of the Anza Trail there. Educator. 
She's been performing Juana Briones' uh, Chautauqua. Chautauqua is a, an old 19th century word, actually. Uh, well, it was used in the 19th century. That um, tents used to go around and perform and educate people. Uh, there's a town, a city in New York named Chautauqua for these kind of literary festivals that would bring literature and the humanities to life. And a modern day Chautauqua does similar things. Um, where very talented people embody people from the past to bring them forward. <coughs> Olga also teaches storytelling uh, to many different kids of many different ages, uh, including old ones like me. <laughs> so Olga will be presenting uh, Juana Briones in the first person um, and in costume, and that will be in about for about 20 minutes. And then then she'll step out of picture uh, and just be da 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 Olga. Um, and she'll be able to answer your questions uh, as Olga, as a modern day 21st century woman. So please. Hello, good afternoon, buenas tardes, and welcome to the California Historical Society. Uh, my name is Anthea Hartig, and I have the honor of being the executive director here to welcome you to our Mexican Mother's Day celebration. Uh, many of you know that Mexican Mother's Day has been celebrated every day on May 10th since 1922. You might not know the 1922 part, but it's become just a beautiful day in Mexico and throughout um, the, the world that we live in, which of course is Mexican, uh, not before it was American. Um, today we have a very special treat for you. And before I introduce our very esteemed and very a beautiful guest. I want to thank all of my staff and my volunteers and all of you for being here. Um, you've been uh, having a beautiful afternoon starting at noon. Yes, and so please um, pick on flowers for your mommies and make bracelets and uh, enjoy uh, enjoy and learn uh, all about Juana Briones, Sousa, California, which is the exhibition that uh, envelops you right now. So, without any further ado, it's my true honor to introduce um, Olga Loya. Olga is a storyteller, and she will be presenting for us uh, Juana Briones, Itapia de Miranda, in the very first person. So she's going to be dressing up as as Juana. Um, she'll be kind of feeling Juana's presence and knowing her history deeply. So she'll present to you uh, kind of what we call in first person uh, her interpretation of Juana Briones. Olga is an author, a storyteller, a performance artist, and I think deep in her heart a wonderful educator. She's been performing Juana Briones uh, Chautauqua. Chautauqua is a, an old 19th century word actually. Uh, well, it was used in the 19th century that um, tents used to go around and perform and educate people. Uh, there's a town, a city in New York named Chautauqua for these kind of literary festivals that would bring literature and the humanities to life. And a modern day Chautauqua does similar things um, where very talented people embody people from the past to bring them forward. <coughs> Olga also teaches storytelling uh, to many different kids of many different ages including old ones like me. <laughs> so Olga will be presenting uh, Juana Briones in the first person um, and in costume, and that will be in about, for about 20 minutes. And then, then she'll step out of picture uh, and just be da 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 Olga. Um, and she'll be able to answer your questions uh, as Olga, as a modern day 21st century woman. So please. Cucinando, <laughs> cooking. Oh, we would make. Oh, cabra, goat, barbecue, barbacoa, goat, and the rest. We would put a big pig under the ground and roast it. We would have papas and calabazas and all kinds of beans and, and arroz and tortillas and chile. And we made pasteles, and sasamura, blackberries, and then manzanas, apple. And in the afternoon, we would come together and we would eat. And then we would eat. And then we would eat. <laughs> After that, everybody would clean up, and then we would dress up. The men would be dressed in their velvets and leather pants with their vests and their shirts beautifully embroidered by we women. And we women would be in our full skirts with our hair up, held up by tortoise combs. And there would be musica, guitars, guitars, and violins. And sometimes there was even a harp, and there was always cantando, singing. There would be dancing and singing. 
many an idea for a wedding happened at one of those fiestas. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we were all related to each other one way or another, either by familia, or by matrimonio, marriage, or by comadre and compadre. If, if you had a child, like if I had her, I would look for, I would look for someone to be the co-mama and the co-papa, the co-father and the co-mother, the compadre y the comadre. So, she, so since we had many children, we had many comadres and compadres. And the papas, the papas ruled. When people walked in, the children walked in, they kissed the papa's hands. And the papa decided who the young women were going to marry. And if he said no, they were not allowed to marry. And sometimes they weren't even allowed to talk to each other. But ooh, the eyes can say so much. <laughs> can you all do that with me? Ooh. In 1820, I married my husband, woo, Apolinaro Miranda. He was in the cavalry. We lived in, in, in Poland Springs with my sister, Guadalupe, and Candelario, and Maria Luz, and my papa. And, well, you know, they say that Poland Springs has great powers of fertility to help people have children. Well, it must be true. I had 11 children. <laughs> but Guadalupe, she had banked at 20. And we had many children because we wanted to populate the land. And because we needed help with the ranchos. We needed to be able to be able to do that. And then my husband, he got a land grant. And, and though at that time, all the missions were secularizing. They were giving away the land to the retired soldiers. And he got a land crown at El Ojo de Agua de Figueroa. We went, it was by the Yerba Buena Presidio. And we went, we built a corral, and we built a little casita house, and we went there, and we lived there. And it was there where I began to help the marineros. These young men, they were doing the ships, and the capitanas, the capitanas were terrible. They would think they were gonna have an aventura, an adventure, and it turned into a pesadilla, a nightmare. They wouldn't be allowed to leave the ships. They got sick, they weren't allowed. They broke bones, they weren't allowed. But then they found out I was a curandera, and they would come to me, I would heal them, I would hide them in my lap, and then I would send them to my brother in Pinol. One time I had three young men at the same time. Charles Brown, he was from the East. Gregorio Escalante, he was from the Philippines. And Elijah, he was an Indio. The Elijah, he was a very good cook, but he wasn't very smart. One day he was out cutting some wood, he was up on a branch, except he was sitting on the outside of the saw. <laughs> he was sawing and sawing, and when he cut through, do you know what happened, don't you? <laughs> he fell. Ah, pobrecito. Se quebró su brazo, he broke his arm. I had to set his arm and, and do a poultice, a, a comfy poultice on him. But I did not get to stay very long at Ojo de Agua de Pigarora de 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 because my husband, he retired, and when he retired, he began to beat me, and he began to say horrible things to me, and he wouldn't stop. I'd say, por favor, no hagas eso, do that, por favor, don't do that, por favor. He would not listen. And so I got my own land grant, Yerba Buena. And I was happy to be there with my family, my familia, and my helpers, and my animales. And I was happy to be a California woman. Because a California woman could keep their inheritances. They could keep their land. Mm -hmm. Not like the Americanas had to give them all to the men. <laughs> <laughs> and I was happy to be there and working, as, and working on all my different things. I was a ranchera. I raised cattle and sold the hide and the tallow. Mm -hmm. And we would have these big remudas where all the vaqueros from different ranchos would come together to gather the cattle because they were wild. And they would make this sound. Can you all do that with me? And they bring all the cattle. But the moment the vaqueros went away, the cattle went off on their ways. And so the vaqueros would have to do it again. You ready? All day long. They had to do the work by a spring or a, or a creek because it was messy work. It was called a matanza, the killing. They would take a steer and put it in the middle of the, of the, of the corral, and a vaquero would lasso its head, another vaquero would lasso the feet, and then the horses would go in two different directions until the steer was just stretched out. And as soon as he was stretched out, a vaquero would jump off his horse, and the horses were long chain, they would stay, and they would come and slit their throats. And that that's where we got the hide and the tallow. Gracias a Dios that I had that hide and tallow to, to support me. I was also a dairy farmer. I raised cows and sold the milk. And there was one man, Mr. Tomas, he came all the time. 
And, and when we had the, the cows were no more tame than the steers. We had to tie the cows up because they would kick and tie their feet. And one time he came with a friend and his friend, and he was sitting on the fence. And Mr. Thomas said, I'd like some milk. I said, Jose Alecito, my son, bring me a container. He came out with a container. We had the horse, the cow already trained, the cow already tied up. I went under, but the, she was terca, stubborn. She wouldn't give any milk. I knew what to do. Jose Alecito, bring me a calf. I brought a little baby calf and put it under that cow, and the little baby calf started sucking. Oh, that cow couldn't have resist. <laughs> I started giving milk. And so I milked, and, and then the, the, the Senor Tomas' friend said, Hey, I'd like some milk too. He said, Jose, bring me, another, bring me another container. And when he came out with a container, Jose, Senor Tomas, and his friend began to laugh. They laughed so hard, they fell off the fence. I didn't know why they were laughing. And, and Senor Tomas said, uh, Could you bring us a different container, please? And we did. I found out later that they thought that container was a chamber pot. Ah, I would never uh, have used a chamber pot for milk. <laughs> and when they came, they would buy vegetables because I raised papas, um, uh, potatoes, and onions, and cebollas, and all kinds of calabaza, squashes, and, and I had fruit orchards, I had peras and manzanas, and they would buy them. And you remember when I told you that my mama had showed me how to sew with beautiful small stitches? Well, people liked the way I sewed. They would hire me to make clothes for them and to, to, and to uh, mend their clothes. I was also a curandera. Ah. See if I can make this stick stay. <clears throat> stay, stick, stick. Ah. I was a curandera. I always carried this bag with me. People would come up to me and they'd say, I tengo un dolor de cruz, de stomach, why am I stomach ache? I would take out yerba buena, mint, and I would make them tea, tea or give it to them to make it home, and I'll pass this out so you can smell it. Some I'll pass out, some I won't. Other people would come and say, I tengo, I no puedo dormir. I take out chamomile. Manzanilla, make some tea, and they would drink the tea. Or sometimes they had they had scratches or they had sores. I said, make the tea and put it on you. It'll make you feel better. And sometimes they got hurt, and I would make them comfrey poultices. Mm -hmm. and, and and sometimes you know sasamoras, blackberries. The leaves are very good for, for sore throats and for fever. And so I would give them, they'd come and they'd be so upset because they were so, they couldn't sleep because they had such a, they had such a sore throat. Where is it? It's hiding from me. And this is blackberry. You can't really smell very much of the blackberry. But we make, make a tea out of it. And I always carried Bermuda, rosemary, because it's good for a bad breath, and some people really needed it. <laughs> and I always use ajo, garlic. Garlic as a bomb, garlic as a tea, all the ways. That, and sometimes I, children would be frightened, and so I would bring, I would make little dollies for them. Aww. I'd give them a little dolly. Or sometimes, if, if I had time, I would crochet little dollies for them to make them feel better. And sometimes all my yerbas didn't work. So then we, I'd have my, my helpers make a big hole in the ground and get a big pot and put tierra in their dirt and agua. And what happens when you put dirt and water together? What does it become? Mud. Lolo, mud. And we make this nice warm mud. We lay them into the hole and we put mud on them. And if they complain, we put more. <laughs> in 1852, my brother Gregorio sent for me because there had been a terrible outbreak of smallpox. And so I took all my yerbas, and his son Pablo and I, we worked night and day, and finally we, we were able to help some people, and Pablo got so excited, he said, tía, enséñame todo, show me everything. And so I showed him everything that I knew about yerbas, and you know, Pablo is a doctor, he became a doctor, and he uses a doctor, and also yerbas to heal. And many times, people come, to my house, 
they come into port, uh, and they have, I'll put it right here. I make a mirror when I tea, and we sit, and we talk, as best we can, them telling me about their land, and me telling them about them, and we drink a yerba buena. You know, I never learned how to read or write, but I did learn how to pick people who were trustworthy to work for me or help me. And in 1844, ay, 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 Apolinario, my husband, had not stopped bothering me. I had complained 12 times. He even went to prison, and he wouldn't stop. And finally, I asked a friend to write a letter to the bishop. Please, I want a separation from my husband. He drinks, and when he drinks, he beats me, and he says horrible things. And, and he brings strange people to the house, and he's not even supporting us. We sent it to the bishop in, in Santa Barbara, and, San, and he, the bishop, sent a letter to the alcalde and asked if, please, he would protect me from Apolinario. And Apolinario finally settled down. And in 1844, I got a land grant, 4,438 acres for $300. Wow. <laughs> but we could not move. It was too far. It was 35 miles south of where I was. It took us three years to get there. And finally, we, got, we built the house in the corral. I got my name on Mavis and my, and my helpers and everything down to Rancho Purísimo Construcción. It was a rancho. And in that same year, que Dios lo bendiga, my husband Apolinaro died. We moved just in time. <laughs> Because in 1848, the United States took California away from Mexico, as Mexico had taken away from Spain. And then, in 1849, Chihuahua, the gold rush. Yeah. Oh, the people rushing, wanting the wealth and the gold, coming and they wanted tools and they wanted food, they wanted, they wanted clothes, they were coming. Where there had been a few people, there were thousands of people, where there had been a few shacks, there were few, thousands of shacks, and the law of the mud was so thick that we walked on planks, and if you fell off the planks, it stank. Poochie, poochie, poochie. <laughs> and the ratones, the rats, they were so big, we called them conejitos, little rabbits. <laughs> I did not like going to San Francisco, but sometimes we went, we would fill the carretera cart full of heights, and with the oxen, we would go to San Francisco. And there would be ships there. Come in, they come in, and it would be like a fiesta. We would wear our best Sunday clothes, and we would go, and we would trade and buy things. And they would have things like, oh, silks and buttons and tools and, 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 and shoes, things that we didn't have. So we would return with money that we'd gotten from the heights and also things that we had traded for the heights. And then the land commission that said that we had to show our deeds, our diseños. Now many people had deeds, but they weren't any good. They had been from tree to tree, the trees had been knocked down. They'd been from river to river, and the rivers had been diverted. You had to show those, those, those designs, those diseños. And they said that since Apolinano Miranda was dead, that the land was not being used. Ooh, we thought that was very funny in the family. Yeah. It was a family joke. Yeah. He'd never been interested in the land. We, uh, me, I was the one that was working with the land. And I thought, I am not going to let them take my land away from me. And so I got an abogado, a, a, a lawyer, and we went through the courts from 1850 to 1864. And finally, we won. The land was mine. I, I do not go to San Francisco very much anymore, but I do go to San Jose, Half Moon Bay. I go to Zapatera. I have my little black bag, and the children are convinced that I carry a bag and the, a baby in the bag, <laughs> because when I get there, there's no baby. When I leave, there's a baby. <laughs> They're always trying to see in the bag, but I don't let them see it because you have to have some mystery in your life. <laughs> I have seen many changes in my life. I've seen the change of power from Spain to Mexico to the United States. I have seen the secularization of the missions that gave all the land away to the retired soldiers. I have seen the gold rush that changed the way that the land and people were treated. 
I've seen the Foreign Miners Act that said that only the Americanos could mine, no one else. And I said to my, my hijos, my sons, mijos, you don't go out there. It's Billy really Grosso dangerous. Stay here. Sell them the hides, sell them the food, sell them your clothes. You'll make more money here and you won't have to work and it won't be dangerous. And then the Land Act that took so much land away from so many people. And some people got all the way to the end and won, except they had no money left. You know who had all the money in the land? The abogados, the lawyers. I saw the iron horse, the train that changed the way that people traveled and moved. It's 1868, and I don't go there anymore. But some things have not changed. My familia. I still, we all get together. They come to Purisima La Concepcion, Guadalupe from Half Moon Bay, and Gregorio from Bolinas, and, and, and my brother Felipe, he died, but his wife took over the rancho, and she comes, Elvira. We all come together, and we dance, and we sing for days, and we eat, and sometimes somebody says, Tia, or Abuelita, how did you do all those things? And I say, Dios me llamó. <laughs> God called me to be a curandera, and if I could be a healer, I could do anything. Ah, yes, I have had a good life. Gracias a Dios. And now if you'd like to ask me, Juana Priona, some questions, I would like to try to answer them. Yes? Did you ever meet Yes, yes, yes. He was quite a movement in himself. There was a, there was a lot of problems, yes. What is the mystery surrounding no photographs and drawings of you? I don't even know what you're talking about. You'll have to ask Olga when she comes. <laughs> yes? Pardon me? I know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, because I started doing it very young, yes. And I had 11 myself, but I had a horrible thing happen. I lost three in one year, in 1828, from the smallpox. In 1829, I lost another one. So I had a child, Maria Presentacion, in 1821, and then I lost all those children. And in 1831, I started up again. At Tomas and Narcisa and, and Maria Rojo and um, Jose, Jose Julian, Manuela, and Jose Anacito. And I, daughter, I, 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 I adopted an Indian girl, Cecilia Chihuahua, officially adopted her in 1838, so we had, there were eight of us. I assume you attended your children's births too, your daughters? Oh, yes. And the godparent to many of them. <laughs> yes? Can you tell us a little bit about your descendants? Your descendants, your offspring, children's children. You had brothers and sisters. Yes. They had children. You had children. I assume that they also married and had children. Yes. Okay, so what, what about the descendants? What, what role did they play in California sisters? Most of them were part of doing, were part of the rancho. Uh, 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 let's see, two of my daughters married a mesas, who were have ranchos. My mesa, my mama mesa had a rancho, and then they, uh, Manuela and, and Maria Brafujo married mesas, so they were in the rancho life. Everybody was involved in the rancho life, and the children helped because we needed the help. And there was a time. There was a time when I had my oldest child was 17 and my youngest was seven. I needed help. They weren't. They couldn't do the work, and so I had other people helping me. Juana, I'm just amazed. I really amazed. You didn't read or write, yeah. and you did all of this. Yes. How did you do this? Gracias a Dios. Dios me llamó. God called mm -hmm. me. I paid attention. When I wrote a contract, I, I, I sold half my land to uh, Michael Murphy. And when I wrote a contract, I wrote that he I told him where he had to have the fence. I told him that he couldn't lease anything, uh, he, that it was the lease, lease, and he couldn't lease to anybody else, that he could only have cows. It was very, one, two, three. I, I, I had a brain. I couldn't write, but I could tell people to write for me. And so I set a very, very clear 
leads to him, that there was no way that he could misunderstand. And that's what I did with the different things that I did. Who was your mentor? Who was helping you, guiding you, really, to um, make these kinds of decisions and, and demands? Well, my sister, Guadalupe, she was also a curandera. Yeah. And my, 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 uh, my sister, Epicicia, and Gregorio and I were very close too, and he helped a great deal. He was the one that lived in Bolinas, that lives in Bolinas. He helped a great deal. Did you learn English? I never did speak it really well, but it, it, um, as soon as I saw that it was important, when the Americanos started coming, I realized that I needed to learn some English to be able to communicate, and that's when I started to learn. It was basic, but I was able to communicate. Any other questions? Yes? Um, Juana, you're such a strong woman. Um, were there other women during right now, this time that you respect that were strong, like you at Lone Property? Can you tell us about some of these? There was a woman named Apolinaria, Apolinonia, Apolinaria, Apolinaria, and then my brother's, sister, my brother's wife, um, Elvira. She, many times people got grad grants when their husbands died, then they applied and they kept the grants and they kept going, like Elvira, Apolinaria, there was different women who had, and some people got the grants themselves because in those days, in our day now, we can, women can have grants. Um, so we could get the grants, but many times it was when the husband died and they, they applied for the grant and they got it and they got it and they kept the grants going. So there were women doing this. Hmm. Do you know if, if uh, that land is still uh, today in, in, uh, in your family somewhere? It's in my land, my family right now. And does, is, it's 1868, see. But, I mean, now in the future, I don't you know, know anything? You'll have to ask all of that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> As of 1868, I own half of the Rancho Purisima Concepcion. I gave 50 acres to my different children. So it's like a little necklace of the border between me and Michael Murphy. It's a border of, of land for my children. And I live, right now, I live at Purisima La Concepcion. And that's down uh, south of San Francisco? Si, 35 miles, 35 miles from How do you think like, women are viewed in your time? Well, I think a lot of times they were seen just as, I saw many women who were not treated well. Um, I wasn't treated well by my husband, except I didn't let it happen. It took me a long time to stop it, but I didn't, I didn't stop complaining. I mean, 12 times, 12 verses to complain, but I didn't stop. Um, women were treated, were, were treated like they were in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the Misiones or the Californios, they were treated differently. They were treated more as equals. Well, Americanas, no. No, they were not treated at all as equals. Everybody had their work. The women had their work that they did, and the men did their work. And then for me, I had both. Because I had the rancho. I had people who did the rancho. I had people who helped me. But I also had to do the business. Did you find that difficult with men? Your relationship with men? Because of yeah. your... You know, I think, with, I think I've thought about it and I think it had helped because I was a curandera. Because 